Welcome to Jordan. If you're joining me for the first time, hi, I'm Caroline, and so far in this series, I've bobbed around effortlessly in the Dead Sea and enjoyed experiencing one of its shoreline resorts for the day. I've hiked a good chunk of Wadi Gwir, scrambling around in places and discovering a true oasis within the desert. We've already began to scratch the surface of Petra by visiting late one afternoon and then returning again for Petra by night. Today, however, we plan to start early, go much further into the site and dig much deeper for the historical understanding of what life was like for those who lived in or those who visited Petra back in its heyday. Good morning and welcome to the ancient city of Petra. This might not necessarily be the most famous or well-known backdrop to this place, but it is in fact the original entrance into the city. We know this because originally it used to have a double arch that spanned from one side of the canyon walls to the others, but unfortunately it collapsed in 1895. And you can still see the remnants of it. And off to the side, you've got the basils where either a bust of the king or the emperor at the time would have once sat. Still making our way down through the canyon towards the treasury, and we come across this here, which is a camel caravan that's been carved into the rock. We can see a driver here at the front. Unfortunately, it's only from his waist down, but what we can probably depict from the way in which the garment falls is that he was wearing some kind of a woolen clothing, and he's got a stick in his bent arm that would have been used to drive or point the camels in the direction that they needed to go in. Behind we've then got some camels sat down and this one particularly at the front has got a very large hump which will probably give a nod to the fact that this caravan was coming in carrying the goods. One of the reasons why Petra was able to prosper so well was because it relied on these camel caravans that were just constantly either coming into Petra with goods or picking up goods that were made here in Petra and taking them out to be sold. And this obviously is a great nod to what made this city as great as what it was. One of the great mysteries in Petra is the fact that this was a huge city that just popped up in the desert. And one of the age old questions was, where did they get their water from? Well, as we're walking through the canyon to get to the treasury, we can see along the side these gullies. And what it's thought is that these were actually cut out to house piping. You can start to see little rivets in it where you can see one bit of the pipe ended and then it would have connected to the next one. Even though this city was built about 2,000 years ago, the science and the engineering behind it was on point because the degree angle at which these have been cut is around about that 4%. Any steeper, and what you would end up having is a big buildup of air, and therefore the water wouldn't run down quite as smoothly, and it would put pressure on the joins of where the pipes connect to one another, then causing them to crack. And if you think a little bit like if you try and put a bottle an empty bottle into some water and if you don't get the angle quite right we end up with those bubbles that come out and we don't have the water going into it quite as beautifully as if you have it on quite the perfect angle and it would be exactly the same system here and naturally when the rains fall the water could then be collected and channeled down into the city of Petra. We made it along to the Al Khazna, which is better known as the Treasury. It stands at just shy of 40 metres in height. Unlike a lot of the Roman sites that I've been lucky enough to go and visit over in Italy, where they would have carved the rock and then chosen where they wanted to place it, this has actually been carved into the cliff face. 
I've read and watched many documentaries about how this might have actually have happened. Some people wondered if the rectangular cutouts of rock that run all the way down the side of the treasury might potentially have been wooden scaffolding where the, the wood has pressed up against the rock. But then other people have come in and said, look, we're in the middle of a desert. There's barely any trees that grow here. Where would they have been getting all of that wood from in order to use scaffolding that would need to be up as high as 40 meters? Instead, other people have theorised that potentially people clambered up the side of the rock face and then cut almost like a tunnel into the rock at the highest point of the treasury. At that point from that tunnel overhanging, they were able to put one piece of scaffolding that was then being put into the rock and people would have worked on that, chiseling and chipping away at the very top part of the treasury. Once they were done with that section, they could then lower that scaffolding to another platform underneath and then they would work away at that and keeping on repeating that process as it got lower and lower. Naturally, as they're chiselling away at the rock, a lot of it would have fallen off, creating something of like a mountain of rock that at some point they could then say we can do away with the scaffolding platform and we can just clamber up on this pile of rubble and we can start chipping away and chiselling away from that point instead. The name Treasury comes from the Bedouins who, as legend has it, seems to think that there was treasure hidden in the very top in the urn and if you look really closely you can see lots and lots of bullet holes where as what we would probably assume people have tried shooting at that urn thinking that there was treasure hidden inside. However, after several attempts of bullets hitting at it and realising that it was pretty much solid on the inside, people have realised that there wasn't actually any treasure hidden inside of there. Instead it's more recently been discovered that this is in fact a tomb where they seem to think that a king was probably buried. It would probably make sense that it was royalty given the extravagance and the amount of time and workmanship that would have gone into creating something like this. I wouldn't have assumed that it would have just been a regular everyday person, it probably was someone royal. Sadly today we're unable to go inside and whilst I say sadly there is very good reason and that's because with all of the human beings going inside of there the moisture coming out of people's breath was starting to really erode away and cause issues for the inside of the tomb so that's why today we have to admire it just from the outside. The theatre is the only theatre in the world that has been carved out of rock and it could seat up to 4,000 people and that I think just gives a really good indication as to just how many people probably lived in Petra because if you think about a really small town if they are lucky enough to have a theatre it's probably going to be a very small theatre yet really large metropolis cities have large theatres potentially even more than one so if you've got a theatre that can seat 4,000 Petra must have been heaving with people in its heyday. Behind me is the colonnaded street. This is what would have been used as the general marketplace where people were able to sell and trade things like frankincense, myrrh, also semi-precious stones and things like textiles and spices that have come over from India. And these are the sorts of things that those camel caravans that I was talking about early would have been bringing in for sale here at the market. Archaeologists have however found things like coins and also bed springs. So what they think is that there might have been a tavern here where people were able to come have a drink, have some food, but also sleep on a nice bed overnight. In the 300s AD, there was an earthquake that unfortunately destroyed most of the Roman columns and the buildings that were along this colonnaded street. More recently, they've found the bits of the columns that you can see off to one side strewn across the road and they've put those back together to try and give a bit of a depiction as to what this street perhaps looked like way back in history. <laughs> Thank you.
We are headed in the direction of the monastery, which is up about 800 steps. So we've come up maybe about 20 of them so far. We found this little shaded bit just off to the side of the path. So we're gonna stop, have some breakfast because we've not actually eaten yet this morning. And then once we've refueled, we'll be ready to conquer these 800 or so steps up to the monastery. As an avid hiker, I didn't find the upwards climb difficult. As a person wary around unfamiliar animals due to their unpredictability, this hike, however, did cause other problems. Particularly when the locals and their donkeys would come hurtling down what in those moments felt like immensely narrow walkways. My assumption is that the quicker the entrepreneurs can return to the bottom, the more quickly they can make their next sale. The path also forced us to walk through several stalls, so a strong will to keep saying no thank you as you walk through each one was much needed. After having made it up the 800 odd steps, we've managed to come out to this, the monastery. It's the largest monument here in Petra. If you remember back down at the treasury, how I talked about the height of it was just shy of 40 meters, whereas the height of this one is just over 48 meters, and then the width of it is 47 meters. Unlike a lot of the other sites around Petra, where they'd hollowed out the rock for tombs for people to be put after they died, this was a little bit different. This was actually used for religious purposes, and like most of the places in Petra, we can't go inside, but what we do know from archaeologists is that along the side are benches, and then right at the back of it is an altar. As well as the reward of the magnificent monastery when you've hiked to the top of those 800 odd steps, there's also a really lovely big cafe with really nice seats that are quite soft overlooking the monastery and they serve just about every single drink that you could possibly think imaginable from hot things like teas and coffees to iced coffees, they've got juices and then fizzy drinks and they've also got a few sandwiches and things like chocolate bars and crisps and what have you. Something that I wasn't aware that was up here I thought that there was only like one place really where you could get food within Petra so it's quite a nice surprise to come up here and find that they do also serve food too. After our visit to the monastery, we've decided to go just a little bit further up because we kept on seeing signs like quite literally everywhere saying view this way, view this way. And so we followed one that didn't look like it was going up to a peak. And we've just come to a point where there's like a valley on both sides and the views are absolutely phenomenal. I would strongly recommend that if you've made the effort to get all the way up to the monastery, I'd say have a bit of a breather in that cafe, take in the actual monastery itself, but then don't turn around, keep on wandering and just explore the area area that is immediately around here because this scenery is breathtaking and honestly even though I did loads of research before coming here I didn't realize that there was this so yes it might not be the historic side of things but from a geology point of view or just spectacular landscape point of view so worth it <laughs>
So if you're coming into Petra, just past the street of Colonnades, but before you start the ascent up to the monastery, there's a place called the Basin. And it seems to be like the only kind of legit place where you can come for lunch. And they've got three different options. One is a help yourself buffet, which is 12 JDs at the moment. They've also got falafel salads, which are 10 JDs at the moment. Or you can get like a, a boxed lunch is how they described it. But of course they brought it out in a bag rather than in a box and that's eight and so we've decided to go with this because we're just going to share it as like a light lunch but i'm actually quite impressed with how much stuff is in here so in the tin foil you've got uh four falafels we've got some luncheon meat which i'm like 99 certain that that's beef so i will be letting andy eat that because i don't eat beef there's a couple of the cheese triangles they've given us some yogurt some flatbread and then a whole load of like fruit and vegetables so we've got tomato i think that's cucumber if it's not it's a courgette zucchini but i think it's cucumber and then a couple of oranges as well and as i say that came to eight jd's oh and i don't think i talked about the dessert there's some kind of wafer in there as well so oh custard cream biscuits can i swap this can i have this and you can have the beef does, does that sound like a good deal nope no, oh, well, it's worth a try. But yeah, I'm hungry now, so I'm gonna get dug in. And I can also see that there's a stray dog right here that's gonna be begging for this food any second. No, it's all ours, sorry. I've come up onto the hillside that's opposite the Great Temple and looking down onto it, you can really start to understand and appreciate how and why they're able to claim that it's around about 7,000 square meters in size. The columns that you can see have obviously been knocked down over the years, most likely due to earthquakes, but they are expecting that those columns reached highs of about 15 meters. Before coming out to Jordan, I watched a documentary where they were interviewing an archeologist who had worked within the Great Temple. She talked about how when she first turned up, she was told that she was going to be working in the marketplace. And so in her mind, she was just assuming that way back in history, it was once upon a time a market. However, when they started the dig, the elements and archeological finds that they were coming across gave more of a nod to hydrological findings rather than marketplace findings. They seem to think that this temple probably housed gigantic pools of water. And what one person might think seems a little bit crazy that you would take a desert area where the one thing that's really, really scarce is water and to use it in such a frivolous way of filling up these huge pools. But of course, back in those days, the Nabataeans, they were very wealthy. They'd made their money through the trading routes. And then they had these very skilled hydrological engineers who knew how to make the most of the water and the rainfall and how to keep a hold of it house it in a in a desert like this and what they were saying to the rest of the world and all of the people coming in on those camel caravans was we are great look at what we are able to achieve and I suppose if you liken it to somewhere like Las Vegas or Dubai where yes you're in the middle of a desert and yet due to the wealth that these countries have got and the ingenuity and engineering they've been able to do similar things you know all you've got to do is just look at something like the Bellagio Hotel with its fountains again it's water in a desert but it's saying look we've got the wealth we've got the knowledge we've got the know-how and I guess the Nabataeans were just doing exactly the same thing in the great temple behind me. Next stop is at the church. There's no specific name that's been given to it, but this is likely to have been built in around about the fifth century, so a lot later on than some of the other things that we've seen in the site today. It's expected that some of the ruins from the nearby temples were probably used to help build certain aspects of this church, but unfortunately about a century after it was built, they do seem to think that it was destroyed either by fire or potentially fire and earthquake. What they found upon stumbling across this church is really, really beautiful mosaic floors on both the north and the south sides. The mosaics have got some beautiful patterns in it that depict either the seasons, which seem to be on the other side of the church, or behind me, things like animals and food too. The 
map that we were given doesn't actually show a path leading up to things such as that church but we've made our own way up here because it's very obvious that there are paths up here and instead of then going back on ourselves towards the basin and then going along the main street we've decided to keep on going along and it's given us this amazing view of the royal tombs there's four tombs in total. The one on the far side is the urn tomb and it's called that because of the urn that sat on top of it and it's got a really big courtyard out the front of it so we're hoping that we'll be able to get to go up and wander up onto that courtyard to get a slightly closer view of it. The next tomb along is the silk tomb and this one is supposed to have really beautiful rock colours almost like stripes and wavy lines running throughout. The one next to that is the Corinthian tomb and this looks not too dissimilar to the main treasury tomb. However, unlike that one, this one's a lot more eroded. And then the final tomb right on the very end is the palace tomb and it is particularly grand. I think it's about five stories in height and there's more of that hydrological engineering that's gone on as they believe that there's some kind of dam and a channel for water to be able to run behind that tomb. They also believe that it was probably used either for banqueting purposes or for funerary, so when someone has died. Unlike all of the other tombs that we've come across since entering into Petra, these ones aren't cordoned off. We're allowed to actually go inside of them. I have no idea what makes these less susceptible to the breath and the condensation that would be caused on the roof that would cause the spoilage that is the reason as to why we've not been able to go into any of the other ones. Just the carvings of the rock and you can see the chisel marks. You can see obviously where, well I say obviously, it's where I'm assuming that the human bodies were then laid to rest after they died. The marble effect in this cliff face is just stunning too.